Hello everyone. Today we have a guest on the stream. As you have probably met before, this is Thomas. He's my, um, he used to be my roommate, now I'm living somewhere else, but we're still pretty good friends. Um, but uh, just for some random credentials, he's currently, uh, are you just pre-med in general? I'm pre-med in general. It's health science preclinical. Okay, and you are also the drum major for UCF, so yeah. it's, it's a pretty credible source. But today we have uh, two topics. Thomas is going to talk to us a little bit about um, some intro to music kind of topics, and then uh, we'll move towards the more medical field. And, and then we'll have the normal guest stream activities of joining the stock market and our out of the element section. So um, right now uh, we have the paint screen up. I'm not sure why, but we'll switch it over to uh, PowerPoint and we can get started with the first topic. So I will hand it over to you, Thomas. Alrighty, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for having me out, John. So the first topic we'll be uh, discussing here is um, a very common topic found in uh, not only music theory, it's one of the basic things that they start in music theory, but something that almost anyone who's taken any music course, whether it be chorus, band, whatever, what have you, uh, you've probably at least encountered it or heard some mention of it once or twice before and maybe even used it once or twice before for some fun stuff. Um, so what the circle of fifths is, is it's kind of this uh, concept. Um, and it's also, you know, as you can see with the diagram that Jono has up right now, the just uh, <laughs> the uh, it's just exactly what it sounds like a circle. And what happens is the notes that you're seeing the, the F, C, G, and all those notes, depending on uh, whichever way around the circle you're going, you're moving in what's called an interval known as a fifth, which is five whole steps, or more simplistically, seven what are called semitones, or half steps. So a half step would be moving up chromatically. So if you go from F to F sharp to G, so on and so forth, seven of those you'll go from F to, I believe the next one's uh, C. Um, yeah, yes. F to C to G, so on and so forth. And then what the circle of fists represents, it represents uh, three different things. Um, the most simplistic of which, and most anyone can figure out, is notes. Um, the next one you would most likely figure out is it represents uh, chords. Um, you can use it for chord structure and building chords. Um, and the third, and one that most people normally encounter, um, and the one that I'll spend a little bit more time discussing, was uh, key signatures. So as you can see on the diagram, there's actually uh, key signatures as you move around this uh, circle. And as you're moving around, depending on which direction you're going, there's actually a pattern happening with the key signature. So for example, if you start in the middle here with uh, C, the C major, as you move around it clockwise, you're adding a sharp until we get all oh, the way down. Oh, uh, I went back. There we uh -oh. go. Sorry. <laughs> difficulties. Uh, as we get all the way down to F sharp, also known as G flat, and that's why you see both, because they are the same note, uh, we have hit what is called, you know, the, the last amount. We can only add seven sharps. After that, technically, there are no such thing as more, but also seven sharps is also represented as six flats. And you normally will see, actually, that key is G flat instead of F sharp major because flats are easier to read in music. It's just simpler that way, and it's easier to write that way. And then as we continue to move up now from G flat all the way up to F and then back to C, we are still technically adding a sharp, but since we have flats now, we're just taking away a flat, which is the same thing as adding a sharp. It just doesn't look exactly like that. Um, and if you were to go counterclockwise around the circle, you are technically adding a flat until you can't add anymore, and then you're still adding a flat or taking away a sharp. But... Um, Moving on from just kind of like that, in general speaking, and in application sense, a lot of the time what uh, back now in the Baroque period, so now we're back way, 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 a couple, you know, hundred years ago now, uh, in the Baroque period and even in the height of the classical music composition era, the circle of fists was actually used for composition. Um, it was used to kind of get an idea of chord modulation because a lot of the time it was moving from a major one major chord to the next and they it was just a good way to represent or understand the intervals but also actually in more modern times um, in jazz music it's used for uh, a better understanding and a better uh, 
kind of basis of basic improv for jazz improv, uh, for jazz improv, and then it's also used in uh, more modern music as well for uh, determining modulations and for some very basic, very very basic uh, like background uh, music for chord work. But that's really just a general overview. That was kind of a very quick word vomit there of it that's really only one specific aspect of it but um i'm gonna kind of leave it there for john to maybe have some questions or if we have some comments or anything um well one thing that i i do really like about the circle of fifths is the the kind of natural sound it has when you are following it in a certain direction um right. and and sometimes with uh, i know this is probably getting a little bit more uh complex but with like seven chords when you play a seven chord um there's kind of this eerie like gravity towards the next note in a uh yes. or, or sorry it, it goes counterclockwise when you play seven correct um if you play g set g7 you want to go to c yes i can demonstrate let's get a, let's get some music going here now. yeah so music two. if you play a g chord and then a C chord. If you instead play a G7, it kind of gives that that slight gravity. And the reason that it actually happens is because this note in the G7, the seventh note, um, is only one away from the note that's in the C chord. So you're closer to it. And so that's why it kind of gives that feeling that um, it's kind of pulling it that way. But I, I just... I find it interesting that um, something as simple as this and somewhat mathematical can um, can shed light on those sort of abstract uh, sounds in music. Yeah, and it's it's kind of really cool because like what you were saying with the it kind of you you know you feel this this pull with the seventh chords to the next major chord. It's you know that's part of music and that that you know the circle of fifths is almost representing that you know the concept of wow we're going we're going this direction and you know that you know you can do a lot more with it as you can see even in the circle of fifths um the diagram i provided also has the minors provided underneath all the major stuff mm -hmm. that's where it even gets more convoluted um but the minor chords really same thing as with the seventh chords really just want to pull you to the next next part of the circle. Oh, definitely. So, and that, you know, most everybody has heard some part of that when you listen to, like, even a classical, like, a fugue, you know, the whole time you're in minor, you're in minor, there's this suspense, and then you hit the major chord, and you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I, it's definitely something that I have only scratched the surface on, and I know that with with your schooling and, and general passion for music, you have gained a little bit more experience on that, so uh, I'm glad you could come on and talk about uh, this this topic. And hopefully, if people are interested in the chat or interested in just watching in general, um, we can have you on for some more complex f uh, talks in the future. Um, but I guess now we'll transition over to your second topic, if that's fine. Yeah, that is good with me. If you want to um, go ahead and move to the, the second uh, picture in the uh, PowerPoint there. And this is definitely something that I have no original input on to start off, so uh, I'll let you have the floor until I can come up with something to add to the conversation. <laughs> All right. So and if as I, as I'm going here, because this is there's a lot to this. Um, so as if I if, eh, as I'm going, if you see something or have something or whatever, just pause me yeah. something. I'm gonna wave me down. Uh, definitely. And I'll try and see what I. Can do so you can see uh, has something to do with blood um, because we have this picture of hemoglobin. Um, so let me back up a little bit here, and what I'm talking about is a blood disorder known as thalassemia. Um, it is you know most everybody's heard of sickle cell anemia at some point, one or another. I'd hope so, um, but a uh, just equally as common and just as uh, complex disease, although it is can be just as fatal if not more is thalassemia. And what thalassemia is, is there's actually two subtypes. And actually, before I get ahead of myself here, I'll go back to the hemoglobin picture we have up. And hemoglobin 
is this component in your blood, and it's a protein component. And what it is responsible for is carrying oxygen, picking it up in your lungs, and bringing it throughout your body so that your body can have oxygen, and then you can do uh, aerobic metabolism. So what happens is uh, the hemoglobin is comprised of four subunits, two alpha chains and two beta chains. And these are located on your chromosomes. Uh, the alpha chains on chromosome 16, and there are two different alpha chains, so there are two different alpha chain coding regions on chromosome 16. And then on chromosome 11, you have one copy of the beta chain coding region. So, you know, when you double that, because we have diploid, you would have four copies total of the alpha and two copies total of the beta. What happens with thalassemia is depending on if you have alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia, you have completely uh, a defect in producing either the alpha or beta chains. And we'll first talk actually more specifically about the beta thalassemia, as this one is actually must, much, much less severe. There are two subtypes within it, major and minor. And of course, as the name would lead on, beta thalassemia minor is the least severe, and if uh, people who suffer from it might have a little bit less uh, beta chain production. Uh, um, they have one defective copy instead of two of the uh, beta chain producing region on their chromosomes. So ultimately, these people will have at the most mild anemia. That's about it. Uh, whereas those with the major form of beta thalassemia will actually end up having um, an enlarged kidney, spleen, um, possibly even sometimes, although much, much less uh, common, an enlarged heart. Um, though both of these people will live on forever and it'll be relatively normal. I think um, the uh, Grinch actually had that at the end of the movie. The Grinch? <laughs> <laughs> the yes, he, he did have an enlarged heart. He, he might have had thalassemia, you know? Yeah. Maybe maybe it wasn't uh, the war. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> so... Um, the uh, oh, these people will live basically a relatively normal life. If anything, like I said, they'll have you know for the people with the major form some anemia and some of those uh, enlarged organs, like I said, um, but not too much of a difficulty, and they'll live a relatively normal you know life into their 80s and so on. The more severe form is actually alpha thalassemia. Even though you have more copies, um, it does not mean that it is actually less important. Um, because with the alpha thalassemia, actually, there are two subtypes there. And there is no hemoglobin that the human body can produce that does not have the alpha chains, at least that we know. So without the alpha chains, you basically can't really carry oxygen whatsoever to your body. So with the alpha subtypes, there are two subtypes as well, uh, hydrops fatalis and hemoglobin H disease. The less severe of which is hemoglobin H disease, you have uh, only two proper functioning copies of your alpha chain producing regions on your chromosomes, and you ultimately will end up with an enlarged spleen, kidney, liver, um, you'll need blood transfusions, jaundice, um, there's a potential for iron overload because of all your um, blood transfusions that you're receiving, and most of the people who suffer from this normally die before they are 20, or in their early 20s mm -hmm. at the least. And now moving to the hydrops fatalis, actually, these people uh, you will actually probably most likely never see meet because they will uh, either not be born or be stillborn. And if they are born, they normally, if I recall, die within their first two years of life. But moving on from this morbid death, um, what I am specifically actually wanted to talk about is treatment. And there's actually, this past year in April, a new treatment was developed, um, and that was actually developing a current uh, development on a current treatment. So currently, there's two treatments for thalassemia. The first of which is kind of a band-aid um, in terms of uh, solutions, um, and what they do is they give you blood transfusions every two to three months to replenish the blood supply that you are losing, and they're giving you proper blood supply that is actually uh, has proper functioning hemoglobin so you get oxygen and you don't suffer 
as much. Excuse me. And the reason they have to do it as every two to three months is because your body recycles your red blood cells every about 90 to 120 days at the longest. The other form, which is much, much... Uh, been the trouble here and now they've developed a uh, newer technique with it is um, if you want to move to the uh, third image oh yeah um, the new therapy is a development um, you're seeing the picture for the new therapy and this is a development on what's called hemopoietic stem cell therapy your hemopoietic stem cells are responsible for producing your red blood cells they are located in your bone marrow, specifically your red bone marrow. That's why it's called the red bone marrow, not because it's red. And what happens is these hemopoietic stem cells are responsible for producing your red blood cells. And if these are defective because of this uh, disorder that you have, you're ultimately going to, if you have a well-matched donor, and by well-matched, I mean they not only need to have the same blood type as you, but they need to have a very, very close to identical genetic makeup. So the joke has normally been basically you need your identical twin who doesn't have this uh, disorder to be your donor. Um, they will subject the person who is suffering from it um, to chemotherapy, killing off their hemopoietic stem cells, and then transplant proper functioning ones via injection into uh, the patient that's undergone chemotherapy so that they will get new proper functioning stem cells and can produce proper hemoglobin now. And it's like they never had the disease anymore. Oh, wow. The development is, with, and as that picture shows, it's very similar to, uh, to the process I described, but you no longer need a well-matched donor because we are going to make you the well-matched donor. We will take, before we subject you to chemotherapy, some of your improper functioning hemopoietic stem cells, and that's what the, uh, inject them into a Petri dish, basically, and also inject uh, what's called a lentivirus, which is like a plasmid vector. Um, it has a new region that we're going to put on. And what happens is your chromosomes will take it up, and it should be taken up. Um, this was specifically studied for beta thalassemia. So chromosome 11, which is where your beta chains are, uh, producing region is on your chromosome, will actually take this up, and it will put this, the goal is for it to be upstream, about 40 to 60,000 base pairs upstream from the defective region that you currently have so that it will be produced way, 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 way before the other region. It will be found first when um, the RNA polymerase is reading to you know, make the code and eventually as we continue down with uh, translation for protein production. So that's done. Once we determine that you know, we have enough stem cells and that's taken up, you now get your stem cells back, transplanted into you, same thing. Now, the kind of interesting thing, and the study does make light of this, is this is not a full-fledged cure because we've still, in a sense, not, re not repaired the damage that is already done. We've only inserted something new. So it's kind of like we put a bigger Band-Aid or a better Band-Aid mm -hmm. on something we really still need stitches on. And uh, something that they kind of hinted at, but they don't really discuss too much because that wasn't the purpose of the study, was, um, and this was done back in, actually, they published their results in April of this past year, um, was that you still have this in your germline. You know, your sex cells are still going to have your defective, uh, you know, your thalassemia-containing genes, and that still would be passed on to subsequent generations, potentially, mm. because this is autosomal, it is autosomal recessive, so it is something that potentially won't be passed on, but most likely... Uh, when one family member has it, it's normally passed on. And um, the the whole, um, that was something that they discussed there. And actually, it's uh, kind of interesting because they did mention something that a lot of people within the genetics world may uh, have heard of more recently. Uh, well, not heard of more recently. Heard of, and everybody talks about it now, is the uh, cure-all, something called uh, CRISPR-9 technology. What it lets you do is actually go in and modify sing, almost single base pairs or very, very small uh, single uh, repeating units within a chromosome. And they're actually, I believe they've been using it to study more recently, more prominently, um, malaria. Making the mosquitoes that have malaria actually unable to um, transmit it. Hmm. Uh, 
Um, so that's something that they also mentioned that could be potentially applied. But um, for those of you that are like, oh, but what about sickle cell anemia? Like, so many people suffer from that. They are actually applying this new hemopoietic stem cell therapy to that because that has been used for them in the past, as it is still a blood disorder and same thing. Um, this new development with the beta thalassemia, they, the stem, uh, sickle cell anemia researchers said, oh my gosh, if that worked for them, that could work for us. So that's actually, um, in April, that was also published within their study stating that uh, sickle cell anemia will now be attempting to do that in a trial. Um, as this did go through a clinical trial and the patients that underwent it actually fared very, very well. But that was a lot all at once. Um, so yeah. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, I do have one question. So with the the new process where you are your own donor as i understand um with um so they take the the uh, defective cells essentially right. and modify them with the vectors uh in order to put this upstream correct right it's going to be uh, upstream so it's going to be if this is um this comes out backwards if this is <laughs> the new region this is the region where uh you know if this is the beginning this is the new region this is the region that doesn't work or it's okay. defect. so what i want to ask is um in the in the original process where you would have this ideal donor that mm -hmm. um has working cells but is very close to you um they used chemotherapy to remove all of your cells that were defective Right. and then replace them with the working cells. In this situation, since they're needing some of your cells to replace them, are they still removing the rest of them and then uh, like building up enough donor in order to replace them? Or is it something where the old ones are still there, they've just added some of the new ones so that it kind of beats out? So just so I understand your question, what you're what you're saying is um, for the person who's getting the the treatment. Yes. Um, you're you're asking if not all of their hem like their defective ones are gone, how this affects it? Like it's not going to kill them all off. Well, because what I'm saying is, are they still doing the chemotherapy in between while they have the defective ones in the lab before they put them back in? Yes. So okay. It's, they're going to, um, once you have a well-matched donor, you'll be, un that's when you'll undergo the chemotherapy to kill off everything. And they, to my knowledge, they'll actually do a test to make sure before they do it, mm. uh, to make sure that they're not going to transplant them in and you're still going to have defective. There still is, um, you're not going to 100% get rid of them. Um, of course, yeah. And the goal is, um, I don't know what the exact goal percent is and i don't want to throw a number out there because i know it'll mm. come back to bite me eventually uh so if i had to guess like let's say you know the goal is 75 percent need to be gone so that when we transplant it that is the majority mm. and that is what from what i understand the goal is there yeah so that it, but that that process doesn't change when you yourself are the donor um uh, right. it's because exactly, the only difference is they're going to remove your defective cells first and get them to be properly functioning while you're undergoing the chemotherapy. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to, to make sure because I, I wasn't sure if they were just kind of like throwing a blanket over the bad cells okay. with some good cells in this case since they need your bad cells in order to make the good cells. Right. But um, So yeah, that, that clears it up for me. Um, yeah, is there any final message or do you want to uh, just move on to the next section? I can't really think of anything else I uh, have to add there, so okay. I'm when you are. Well, we will shift over, so I'm going to switch the screen up so you can see. Uh, I took my webcam off, that's great. Um, switch the screen over so you can see the Excel sheet, and we are going to add Thomas here into the stock market. So I know you have been a very avid fan of the uh, John Explains Things stream for a while you probably I, know how the stock market works I, uh, i've been voting every week yeah so um one thing that uh, just to clear everything up for people that uh, may not have been watching too long um 
this season, what we're doing is instead of the 100,000 uh, as a base that you buy in with, you instead get whatever even Steven is at at the current moment. Um, just to kind of even out the situation because last season um, the market was very strong. Um, so when people were buying in, they were actually buying in at a, at a lower level due to inflation. Um, in this case, it's actually uh, somewhat of a weak market. We are below the original starting value of 100,000 uh, Janos for even Steven, but it should work in the same way that um, you're not gaining an advantage from buying in later. Um, so the value that you currently have to buy in with is 91,200. Uh, and it, so, yeah, so it, it's kind of bounced back. It, it was down into the 80,000s um, for a little bit there. But the current values for stock are red with a value of 50, yellow with a value of 131, green with a value of 89, blue with a value of 78, and 12 with a value of 108. So you can spread out your stock however you want. And remember, you don't have to spend all of your money if you don't want to. Um, you can leave some in the bank if you want. Uh, but I will mention that the two people who have not spent all of their money are currently at the dead bottom of the leaderboard. So. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So let's see here. I'm gonna budget. I'm gonna budget. I'm gonna. Uh, I can't speak English, so I can't buy stuff. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> that sounds very racist. <laughs> I am going to. Let's see. So I have ninety-one two hundred. Yes, so, and I do have a calculator if you want. Oh, good. Anything good. <laughs> specific? Yeah. Because I can't do this kind of mental math. Uh, so let's see. Um. You're a doctor. You don't need math. <laughs> <laughs> nah. You don't need math just make numbers up um so let's see here let's do hmm, let's do fifth let's do sixty thousand dollars in blue so whatever that works out in all stock right there. um so we'll go sixty thousand and blue has a value of 78 so uh that gives you 769 and some change um i don't know if you want to round up or round down in that situation but um, or it's if you just want 769 that that works too yeah. which uh we'll do 769 all right around it Seven, around the change down. 769 um, and so that's gonna bring you down to oh um, yeah we'll we'll get the specific numbers so that is that's spent 59,982 of your money so okay. 9122 or 2,000 about like 31 and change? Uh, yeah, I'm doing the subtraction right now. Okay. Oh. 59982. Oh, uh, minus one. I accidentally hit one instead of two. You have 31,218 left. Alright. Let's buy. Let's use. 21,000 for yellow. All right, 21,000, uh, yellow being at 131. Um, that is 160.3. I don't know which direction you want to round. Um, Whichever is easier for you. I mean, I could just type 160 in and then Let's see what that. you got. Um, so that puts you up to 80,942 80, as you're spent. So that leaves you with 80,942, uh, 10,258 left over. All right, let's, uh, the rest of that I will buy one of my other options. I have red, 12, and yellow. Green. You've already bought Green. yellow. You just bought yellow. So I already bought yellow. Um, what's I mean, red you, at? If you want to buy more, you can't. Uh, red is at 50. It's currently the lowest. Let's buy the rest in red. Okay. That probably makes my life easy, because um, 50 is a nice number to divide things by. Um, 10, 2, 5, 8. You should be left with 8. Um, 
Yes, so you're going to have 205 and 8 Janos in your bank. Alrighty. And we'll put zeros in the others just for aesthetic purposes. Um, so now you can see that his value has evened out to 912 uh, or 91,200. Um, and the last order of business on the stock market. Um, is the contestants trends page now uh, I will um, do the actual Excel editing uh, off screen because that is somewhat tedious but I am going to add you to this page and what I what I did this season um, that's different from last season is I'm allowing you to pick a color so that on the graph that shows the contestants trends which is the thing that we didn't have last season um, right people can keep track of how you have done over the course of the season. So you are currently buying in at 91,200. Um, and what color do you want your line to be? Um, is purple taken? Um, uh, there's no one with purple. Do you want like a, a very purple purple or do you want like a lavender or? Let's go with like a, like a deep purple, like, um, like, a. The purple you got behind you actually on the door is perfect. If that even oh is yeah, perfect. the uh, the wig. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. I, that was, I was trying to figure out what that was. <laughs> oh, that's the letters. I don't want the letters to be purple. I want the background to be purple. There we go. Okay, so I picked a purple color. If you, if you don't like it, then we can change it later. But um, it's good. And I will be adding that to the graph here so that it will get more chaotic. Um, but that is the end of the stock market section of the stream. Uh, so you, if you want to follow uh, Thomas's progress or support him by voting in the stock market, I'll put a little uh, link over by his face um, right now. And but that'll only happen off uh, if you're watching not live. Um, so the last thing is something that Thomas has some experience with, um, and that is the out of your element section. Um, oh so I'm going to switch this over to the paint screen and we will get right into that. So um, I was trying to think of something. So last last time I was I was kind of playing off of your hobbies and your, your just kind of casual passions. But today you have two specific topics that you're talking about that you're definitely well educated on. Um, so I thought, you know, why don't we just mix them together? really so uh let's let's uh set the scene here and we're going to just get some um colors in here uh, and that should be good so um i'm just gonna kind of draw something on the screen and i'll, I'll explain things to you because i know that it won't necessarily be in real time even if you were watching the stream um but Basically, what we have is uh, a French horn that is um, it's in it's in need of some some help. Um, some help. Yeah, it it decided to uh, try to um, ingest some sort of foreign object, and it um, it no longer is functioning how it should. And uh, so it's in need of surgery, and so we. Uh, we're wheeling it in on the uh, surgical bed, and now the the floor is you, Doctor Thomas. Uh, the floor is you, apparently. But yeah, <laughs> I um, am the floor. Oh God. Yes, the floor <laughs> is Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> that is rather painful. I don't know why people stomp on me. Um, but okay, so let's see here. So we got a French horn, ingested something. Um, that is now requiring surgical removal, I'm guessing, since... Uh, you are the professional. I am the professional. All righty then. So <laughs> let's see here. So, well, I guess since, uh, you know, we've arrived at the operating room, um, I'm assuming since they probably went to the ER first for them to be coming to surgery mm -hmm. uh, for something like this, they've already determined that it needs surgical removal and it's not something that uh, is upsetting their stomach. So probably the the first thing here we're probably gonna need to do is uh, get the French horn sleeping. You know, maybe play a little lullaby. Maybe okay. have a, so yeah. Got a little 
brass band come and play a lullaby, you know, say goodbye to their friend. Oh, you don't sound very enthusiastic about your performance here. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're concerned. <laughs> they're like, already given up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let this kid... Who we'll let this kid be our surgeon anyways? <laughs> so, um, let's see here. So, now that uh, our lullaby is finished and our horn's asleep, we can go ahead and uh, get the French horn, uh, some oxygen supply going, you know. And then, uh, let's see here. We gotta maybe, uh, gotta figure out what's going on here so i assume probably at this point we have an x-ray result from the er maybe about we'll what uh see what the x-ray has to say i'm just gonna we're we're doing one of those fancy cartoon x-rays where they just have Ooh. like a square and you can see through them um uh yeah we'll i think that that probably shows what i'm talking about um uh, and then uh, let's just get some markers in here. That sounds fun. Um, <laughs> I hate it when my French one just markers. Gosh darn it. No, I was using the markers because it's kind of like transparent. Um, yeah, so if you see that um, inside the uh, French horn, there is actually some sort of uh, smaller rodent-shaped object. Oh. Huh. Someone must have uh, given the horn some candy. Mm. Rats love it when an instrument... Uh, insects love when you uh, play an instrument with... Uh, you heard it here first. Candy. Insects are now rodents. Yes, insects are now rodents. <laughs> <laughs> but since this is a, uh, you know, a live and very probably large French horn, oh, yeah. you know, a rat would fit, obviously. So... So I guess uh, a rat must have uh, smelt and went after the candy or something, you know. Is that uh, where you keep your candy in, in oh, the French horn? Oh, that's where I keep my candy bars, yeah. right, in my horn, right in the lead pipe. Yeah. You know? that's why, in case you uh, need a snack while you're playing. Yeah! You know, I mean, how else are you supposed to survive a concert, you know? You uh, this is true. Yeah. I love it. You know, you got to get some caffeine going. But, <laughs> anywho, so let's see. So we got this... Uh, rat looking object stuck in here and can can we see where uh yeah we so it's it's um i i have probably butchered the actual anatomy of a french horn but at the moment i have it right after the uh the little buttons <laughs> but oh, right. i think okay. i i did not put the buttons in the right place i can guarantee <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking forward to actually looking at this picture later <laughs> so Let's see, so we got the valves here. So the valves, it's right after the valves, you're saying, so right below them. So that means it went pretty far down the lead pipe through some oh, tubes. Oh, definitely there. pretty far down the lead pipe. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty far down the lead pipe. I mean, a French horn extends pretty darn long when you, you really ravel it out. So we've probably gone about, at this point, probably 8 or 10 feet into the horn. Uh, if I'm thinking of the correct length right. So... That's a pretty far launch then, so it'd probably be easier to go through the bell instead of the lead pipe. So we're going to go ahead and see if we can just uh, go ahead and, without making any incisions here, see if we can get our little trusty uh, rodent grabbing device here. Uh, oh, right so on. you got a, got a grabby. You can little... probably get one of those little, like, like dinosaur claws. Dinosaur claws? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, how that's. You... They have those in every surgical situation, don't they? <laughs> I mean, how else are you supposed to get stuff out? You know? So, except this one, instead of being your uh, traditional hard plastic arm, it's uh, all... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Malleable. Flexible? Oh, okay. Flexible, malleable. <laughs> I was gonna say willy nilly, and that's not the good side. I, I, yeah, I was gonna say I think I think you might have to go to a, a different kind of uh, toy store for one of those, Thomas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So uh, <laughs> we um, go ahead and let's see if we can grab this room this way. But 
it's not looking too promising. It looks like we uh, don't have enough length on uh, our little grabber toy here. So I guess we're going to have to make an incision here right around where we, based on the x-ray, think it is. So I guess we'll, uh, since we're metal here with the French horn, go ahead and take our uh, <laughs> handy dandy uh, metal cutters here and go ahead and get on in. You know, can't use a scalpel here. Got to use some metal openers and maybe maybe not use a can opener. I don't think that's appropriate. Yeah, I'm but, drawing like a kind of like a what is it? It's not like a bone saw because it's metal, but you know the band saw like it's like oh, one oh. tiny blade. Yeah. yeah, that would probably get the job done. That'll probably get through. Yeah. Then we got some pliers. We gotta kind of ply the metal back a little bit. Excuse me, so we can really get in there again. All right, and I think you can probably see it by now. So. I think I can. I don't think I even need any items to grab it. I think I'll just reach in with my gloved hand and go on. And but you know, it. Thomas, if you touch the sides, then it's gonna set off a big siren and start vibrating. Oh man! <laughs> Forgot I was playing Operation here. Yeah. Gosh darn it! All right. All right. Well, I I'd say that's a fairly successful. I mean, assuming that you do a decent job with the uh, the welding back together, but. Um, I, I think that's a, a fairly good job. Uh, uh, I would say that's a day's worth of pay for Dr. Thomas. Oh, and we... um, but yeah, this was a successful stream. I'm happy to have you on. And this is you're happy always so uh, so. Uh, you don't say um a lot. That's what I'm trying to say. But I don't know if there's a word <laughs> for that. So, uh, <laughs> but right. yeah, I try not to. Yeah. So uh, this. I, I enjoyed it. I hope the audience has enjoyed it. And if you want to see Thomas on in the future, or if you have any questions about music or medical topics, uh, then I'm sure that I'll be in contact with him. And we can uh, probably have a couple more streams um, in the future. But it, also, if you want to follow him on the stock market, that will be happening every Thursday. Um, in terms of streams in the near future, I should have a cover on Tuesday. I have no idea what that will actually be um nor what time it will be at because there might be a concert on tuesday that i'm going to i don't know uh, but anyways thank you thomas for coming on uh, it was a pleasure i'm just checking to no no more comments or anything uh, so we're going to be signing off but i want to thank you guys for watching um, and if you enjoyed then be sure to check out the rest of the videos on the channel uh, but for now, I'm going to be signing off, so goodbye.